forgot I muted it. <laughs> Starting off bad already. Hi guys, welcome to the chat. So glad to see you tonight. I see you guys chatting away. I love seeing that way before the time that I have to go live. So welcome. Let me go ahead and go live on Twitter as well as Instagram. There we are. And I always like to type I always like to type in the comments section, please join us over on YouTube. So that's my Instagram. So um, so glad to see you guys um, chatting. And I, I really do hope that this conversation tonight is going to be insightful for you. I, I'm going to be honest. I, I feel like I'm going to really be pulling on my mental knowledge, my cognitive ability, uh, all those years in school that I spent to kind of help me be a little bit well-rounded in tonight's live chat. So before we jump into that, though, let me go ahead and just recognize some of you in tonight's chat box. Hello, Jajets. Welcome to the chat. Glad to see you. <laughs> I see that icon. Hi, Deb and Fairy Girl. Welcome to the chat. Glad to see you. Hi, Sammy and Cherry's Jubilee. Glad to see you both. <laughs> yeah, namaste to you too, Cherry's Jubilee. Glad to have you tonight. Um, live life. Hello and welcome. So glad to see you as well. Yeah, I hope you're well too. B, hello. Glad to see you again. Love, laugh, live. Hi, Maggie. Welcome to, uh, welcome to the chat. Glad to see you tonight. You're always on my uh, slowly growing Instagram channel. So glad to see your, your icon tonight. Um, Helen D. Salsa, I hope I said that correctly. Hello and welcome. Chrome Butterfly, welcome and Critter. Glad to see you both. <laughs> Dawn One, hello. Glad to see you. Caitlin Brown, welcome. And I always like to give the camera eye contact when I welcome you. So I'm sorry about that, Dawn One. Welcome. Glad to see you. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of an overview while you guys sign on as to why this conversation tonight. So um, I had another live chat scheduled for tonight. I can't remember what it was. I don't remember off the top of my head. But I started getting all these questions and comments on my Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And some of you guys reach out to me via email and you bring up the most interesting things. And so one person said something to me that really turned my, my topic around from what it was supposed to be to what it is tonight. And, and the email that I got was, how do I know that the family trauma that I have, how do I know that the relationships that I've been a part of, how do I know if the relationships that are going to occur in my future, how do I know if that isn't a curse for me? Like, how do I help my mind. This, this person was struggling with the idea that maybe they are cursed, right? Maybe there's a family curse. Maybe there's a relational curse. Maybe there's something he did wrong and he can't make sense out of it. And so his questioning was, how do I navigate my internal feelings, my existential fear that maybe this is predestination, maybe this is fate, maybe this is destiny, that all of my relationships, including the kind of mother I have, including the kind of father I have, you know, including the siblings that I have that's unhealthy, and the husband or the wife over there that's unhealthy, how do I understand or be okay with the reality that maybe this is the way my life is supposed to be? And so we, we start talking and you know, I mentioned a couple of concepts and, you know, he was like, I never thought of it this way. Thank you so much for that. And so, you know, it was his email and a few other comments I got last week. And I thought, let's talk about predestination and relationships. And in this conversation tonight, I'm going to be mentioning some things you probably have never heard of before, but the psychology, the science, the research of this topic is amazing. And this live chat tonight is only touching the surface. And I mean, only touching the surface. We could go deeper into this conversation and this could last us about three months, you know? So I, I, I picked and pulled some interesting concepts that would be really important for you to understand so that you can look at your own life and situations and be able to determine, do I, do I lean towards predestination, fate and destiny, or do I lean more towards free will or, or do I stop somewhere in the middle? For me, I'm in the middle. I'm going to share that with you. I'm in the middle. You know, there's a side of me. Yes, I believe my life has been has been predestined. I was supposed to be a therapist. I was supposed to be a daughter. I was supposed to be a sister, you know, that kind of thing. 
I believe in that fully. But then I also believe that I have free will and I have free will at every corner and turn and fork in the road of my life to make a decision that's going to impact my life. Does that make sense, guys? So I'm in the middle between predestination and free will. So we're going to jump in here. I see you guys chatting, so I'm probably going to check the chat box before I jump into this topic a little bit further. Um, let me also mention, too, in this introduction for you uh, of this topic, that there's a couple of concepts I want you to be aware of. The first concept is free will, free will. Now, you guys probably know what that is, right? It's the ability to choose between between different possibilities, the ability to choose between different possibilities. There's a possibility over there and there's one over there. Which road am I going to take, right? My mother's a narcissist. My dad's a psychopath. I can either choose to stay in their life and be harmed, or I could choose to walk away and feel safer and less threatened and more loved. I can decide to stay in this abusive relationship or I can decide to leave it and take my chances with custody and courts and, you know, whatever, right? So there's the free will. It's the ability to choose between different possibilities. I also want you to consider the religious doctrine, because when we talk about predestination, we're not just talking about psychology. We're not just talking about philosophy. We're not just talking about existentialism. We're also talking about religious doctrine. And so predestination tends to take on, if you look it up on Google, you know, you'll see the predestination, the term tends to take on a religious ideology. And the religious concept of predestination is this, that pre-creation of the world. So before the world was created, God foresaw your footsteps and he predestined it. He created it for you to walk down. Even the most painful experiences have been predestined and has been created by God before you were even thought of in the mind of the woman who brought you into the world. Okay. So that's the religious doctrine of predestination. Now you also want to think about what's called, and this is the psychology of this topic. You want to think of something called uh, external locus of control or internal locus of control. Let me repeat that. Cause that's a little tricky for some people. <laughs> and especially me, I was like, what? You know, I had to go back over some of my early psychology information before I did this live chat tonight just to make sure that I'm ready for this, you know? But the concept is external locus of control and internal locus of control. And here's what that means. External locus of control says this, that there are situations that have been destined or predestined in my life, even the very painful things. And I have absolutely no ability to make any decisions. Everything happens outside of me. Here I go. I don't have paper and I want to demonstrate something to you. I swear I do this every single live chat. Oh, I don't know how to do this. Maybe I'll go get some paper. Hold on. Let me grab some. Uh, you know what, guys? I'm going to have to start asking you before I get on live chat. I'm going to have to start asking you. Please remind me to get paper. This is the entertainment. You know, we're partly entertain in entertainers on this channel. So here's here's what I mean by that, okay? Here's an external locus of control, okay? Don't judge my drawing. I'm not an artist, I'm a therapist. Okay. So this is an external locus of control. Okay? Can you see that? Hopefully you can see that. So there we go. So you're in the middle there, okay? There's a bubble around you. Ooh, I don't know if you can see that. Here we go. Come on, camera. <laughs> there you are in the middle, okay? And those arrows at the top is what impacts you. Does that make sense? So an external locus of control says this, that here I am in a situation in my life where I have these arrows that's really threatening my well-being, that everything happens to me, right? And so some people, and especially my clients, when they come in for therapy, they feel like 
Everything outside of me is controlling my life. My narcissistic mother, my psychopathic father, my very self-centered cousin over there, my very arrogant and pompous sibling over there, my boss, my coworkers. You know, I have no room in my life to control things with my free will. And so external locus of control says, I am in my world and I've got these arrows pointing towards me it's controlling everything around me and I have no ability to control it with my free will. Um, so in a sense, some individuals in this position or this mindset can start to blame others for everything rather than taking accountability for their own actions. There's, there's also the idea that external locus of control is what leads to depression and anxiety most of the time. Be because the idea is I have little to, to no control over the things that happened to me. It has been predestined, it has, it's fate, it has been destiny. And so because of that, I'm just in this bubble and everything is shooting at me and I have no protection. Now an internal, internal locus of control says this, the idea says this, everything that happens is, you know, based on me, right? My thoughts, my feelings, my actions, my behaviors, all of that is the result of things in my life that I possess the ability to control things. I possess the ability to direct my experience of life. And, and so most people who have an internal locus of control, they tend to be very assertive and they tend to be less depressed according to research. And that's because they believe that they are in control of what's going on in their life. OK, so I want you to keep these kind of things in mind as we move along in this live chat. Let me go back to the chat box and see what you guys are talking about. My goodness, I'm behind. Um, <laughs> absolutely. OK. Hold on, guys. Let me catch up. This is. Ritter. Yes, you're welcome. Says, I appreciate the eye contact. Yes, absolutely. How do we have a conversation if I'm not looking at you, right? It matters. It matters. Free live. Hello and welcome. Glad to see you again in tonight's live chat. Nancy, hello and welcome. Glad to see you. Yeah, happy weekend to you too. I've been literally desperate to get to Friday. Let me just say that. Um, Monday, I was thinking about Friday. Tuesday, I was thinking about Friday. Wednesday, I was really thinking about Friday. So it's been a long week. Caleb Reed, hello and welcome. Glad to have you again. Says, love these live streams. I just got a call from someone I can't stand and I feel pressured to call them back since it's my mom. Oh my God, that's so rough. That's so rough. Hopefully whatever I say in tonight's live chat and the comments in the chat box will make a difference in how you approach that situation. You know, hopefully we'll see. We'll hold out hope. Annie Walker, hello and welcome. Glad to see you in tonight's live chat. Thank you. Says great topic. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Sometimes I have a hard time weighing. Is this a good time to talk about this? Is this a bad time to talk about this? Because I want to give you what you want. At the same time, I have to also give the YouTube algorithm, algorithm, excuse me, what it wants. So, you know, it's a juggle. Target you. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat says, yes, I was predestined because my half siblings placed me in MK Ultra. Ooh, I have to look that up. Yeah, I don't know. I have to look that one up. I'm not I'm not even sure I have a comment on that one. This is the the second or third time you guys have brought up. Some of you have brought up MK Ultra Ultra, excuse me. So I really need to figure out what that is. Um, R.A. Andrews, hello and welcome to the chat. Glad to have you in tonight's uh live. Says I'm looking forward to this topic. That's awesome. I hope it's helpful as we go along. Yeah. Um, Helen DeSalza says, God, this is amazing. Oh, well, thank you. I hope it continues to be. Um, I'm very glad to hear that. Kyra knows 144. Hello and welcome to the chat tonight. Glad to have you. T Mac. Hello and welcome. Glad to see you. Um, okay. I'm just looking for comments that we can kind of tease apart here. Real talk with D podcast. Hello and welcome. Glad to see you again in tonight's live chat. Tarika Styles. Hello and welcome back. 
Yeah, Kyra knows, okay, we were just talking about the religious ideology of predest predestination, because if you do a brief Google uh, uh, search, what's going to pop up if you type in predestination is the religious ideologies. You're not going to see psychology. You're not going to see science. You're not going to even see the research of this topic. There's been a lot of research done on the topic of predestination, but we never find those because number one, those journals are professional and only professionals uh, such as myself and my coworkers, things like that, have access to those research studies. So you guys are not going to be able to see the deep research on this, which is why I'm bringing it to the channel. Um, but you're also not going to be able to find the religious ideologies on this topic as well. So that kind of, that kind of, that's unfortunate, right? Um, but I'm going to make sure I post some things in the description box for you if you want to continue this, this study. But the religious side of predestination, if you look this up on Google, you're going to see nothing but religious comments on this topic. And Kyra knows 144, I'm going to put her up on the screen. I'm so sorry, guys. I always neglect to do that. Says, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Um, and so that's a scripture. That's actually uh, chapter one, uh, uh, chapter one in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, in the uh, King James Bible. And that is a scripture that points to predestination. And that is the religious ideology. And of course, there's many other ideologies, you know, but this is one of them. Um, Annie Welker says, one must wonder how many of the choices we make are obtained from learned behavior. Yes, that is also an important point of this conversation be because research suggests this, that there's a balance between free will and what happens as we're growing up. So psychology leans more on, again, locus of control, um, genetic predisposition. We're going to get into that in a little bit here. Um, it also leans on intergenerational trauma, and it also leans on exposure to your environment growing up. And so Carl Jung, he's interesting. You guys are probably well aware of him. He is a Swiss psychiatrist. He came up with something interesting because he believed, uh, and this is uh, specifically to your statement, Annie Walker, he believed that we have internal unconscious things that is going on within us. We can say that's trauma. We could say, you know, maybe that is some internalized anger from growing up a certain way. We can say maybe that's some kind of internal fear of abandonment because of what we've experienced. We kind of internalize all of those things and they become unconscious. At some point, our brain kind of you know, temporarily forgets about all those internal processes. What Carl Jung is saying or has said in some of his work is this, that whatever's on the inside of us that's unconscious, trauma, fear, fear of abandonment, all that stuff, it has a way of then becoming an unconscious act in our lives, right? So it's it's kind of the theory that, let's say, I'm gonna give you an example of this. Let's say you grew up in a very narcissistic household. All you ever were exposed to was criticism. You know, criticism, condescending remarks from your mom, your dad, competition, anger, rage, um, really needing to be the trophy child for your family. Let's say you went through all of that growing up. You hit the age of 19, you become an adult, right? You realize that, okay, I can't carry this baggage anymore. So I've got to throw all this childhood trauma on the back burner, which means you internalize it. That's what's happening. And so when you internalize that pain, that trauma, it may become unconscious. It's almost like a, you know, a piece of your subconscious. It's still a part of your life and your story, but it's back here hanging out somewhere. That situation can then cause you to act out in ways or pursue relationships that has some kind of unconscious attachment to all that childhood trauma. Does that make sense, guys? So here's what Carl Jung says, and I'm going to pull it up so you can see it. Carl Jung says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Does that make sense, guys? I'm going to post that in the description box for you so that you can look at that yourself. He also says, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. You are what you do, 
not what you say you'll do. So he all he he had this belief system that whatever's unconscious on the inside is going to come out in a way that's going to direct our footsteps in some capacity. So Annie Welker, that was my long, long, long answer to your statement that sometimes it is learned and sometimes it is based on those unconscious things that's happening within us. Instead of saying it's predestination always because it may not be, right? We don't want to lean so much to the right that we forget there's other aspects of life. So predestination is a possibility, yes, but on the other side of that, so too is an unconscious way that you are living and that directs your footsteps. I hope that makes sense. So thank you for that, Annie Walker. You really helped me explain that. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Hopefully that made sense. Kyra knows 144 says absolutely mind blowing. Yes, absolutely. I very much, very much agree. Okay, it looks like you guys are chatting amongst yourselves. Let me just read Caleb Reed, Reed before we jump into the content. Uh, Caleb Reed says, so do I just go through the feeling over and over again with not responding? Let me make sure. Where'd you go, Caleb? Let me see. You say, do I just give in and call to relieve the stress to fix the issue? I mean, I don't know, Caleb, and I don't want to be, uh, you know, someone who says, I'm going to tell you what to do from YouTube. I would have to really know your situation before I gave you any kind of suggestions. Um, but hopefully throughout this live chat, you'll be able to say, okay, now I get what I need to do. So hopefully. Let's jump back in. Okay, guys. So we talked about predestination from a variety of perspectives. Let's talk about the scientific view of predestination. Now, when I talk about the scientific view, the view of predestination, I'm talking about some of the research that's been done. And there's been research done in three important areas. One is the scientific realm, which really looks at the brain and it looks at how our genes interact with our brain, which causes us to kind of internalize lies and deal with internal trauma a certain way. And therefore, as Carl Jung put it, it becomes our reality. And then we think it's fate, okay, or destiny or predestination. The second view is the psychological view, right? The psychological view says, you know, I am this vessel in the world and everything is happening to me. Um, and then we also have the philosophical view, excuse me, which basically says what my first uh, statement here is going to be, which is, intergenerational trauma kind of gets you into a vulnerable state because when you have a family lineage, and I mean from ancestors all the way down to your generation who has experienced trauma, family trauma, PTSD, complex PTSD, racial trauma, whatever the traumatic experience was, and if it never was dealt with, then it becomes a generational issue right? It almost becomes like a family curse, so to speak. When you are in the grips of intergenerational trauma, predestination makes sense because every relationship in your life or experience may seem like the last one. And, and research suggests that that's because it's unresolved. It's unresolved trauma. So you almost slip into this mindset of what's called a trauma reenactment, a trauma reenactment. So you get into, let's say, for example, one relationship with a narcissistic person, you escape. Now you're with a new person and you think that's better until something happens. And then you realize, OK, I'm back with a narcissist. How did that happen? You get out of that relationship and now you become friends with your coworker who's also a narcissist. And now you're trying to find a way to nicely back away from them. Individuals who are in that position often have intergenerational trauma and it's unresolved trauma. And so they reenact it in every relationship because the trauma is unresolved, you know? And I can explain that more. Just let me know uh, if you need me to kind of expound on that or, or, or make it a little bit more explainable. I can do that. Um, also epigenetics. Epigenetics is the scientific view of predestination as well. Epigenetics says this, that we may not have a predestined future, but we do have a predisposition genetically, 
and through our genetic code to experience certain life events. So somebody who has a vulnerability or, or some kind of gene expression that's vulnerable to symptoms of PTSD and trauma, you're gonna be born into the world with that vulnerability. And as you go throughout life experiencing different things, you can be traumatized over time. So research suggests that while it's not necessarily predestin predestination, excuse me, it can feel like it. It can feel like it because of a vulnerability that you have genetically that predestination disposes you to multiple traumas in life. So that's the study of epigenetics. We also have to keep in mind too, when it comes to predestination or the thought that maybe, I'm sorry guys, I saw my camera, camera flicker. I don't know what's going on. I apologize. Um, we also have to be sensitive to the idea that instead of looking at uh, predestination as something that you have absolutely no control over, you might want to look at the fact that trauma shapes all your experiences. So while you may not be predestined to feel traumatized, be traumatized, to experience multiple relationships that feel like they're the same, some people believe they're predestined to have, they were predestined to have very negative and bad parents. Uh, some people believe that they are being cursed because they have one toxic relationship after the next, after the next. And the question mark, like one of my current clients has been, am I being cursed? Am I being punished for something? Because I can't seem to find a, a, a flat surface, a calm ground. I'm constantly getting into similar relationships that are traumatic. We have to keep in mind that while it may not be predestination, it could just be that your traumatic experience has shaped who you are. And Annie Walker said, you know, it has something to do with learning. And so it really does. The more trauma you experience and the more pain that you go through throughout your life, that shapes who you are. You know, if you think of clay, those experiences shape you almost like clay. And so everything that you experience from that trauma onward could feel like it's predestined for you, but it is just simply trauma that has shaped you. And it has shaped how you see relationships. It has shaped how you interact in relationships. And it can also shape how you communicate with other people. Okay. So that's another idea that you want to think about. One last thing here before I go to the chat box and catch up with some of your comments is let's let's look to and I would Google a uh, Saint uh, Augustine. I, I would look up his research. He believes in free will, but he also believes in big free will and small free will. So here's what he here's what he says. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on with my camera again. Um, here's what he says. He says some people. Uh, that have been in situations they know they need to get out of or that are not healthy, it, no, it isn't necessarily that they are predestined to be cursed or they are predestined to have toxic relationships or they are predestined to suffer in life. It's it's what the issue is to St. Augustine, uh, Augustine, I'm sorry, is big will and small will. He believes that some people have a really strong big will and they can will events in their life. They know how to make decisions. They have control over their emotions, things like that. He says people with small free will don't do that. They're too afraid. And so they stay in negative relationships and they tend to repeat negative relationships because their free will is small compared to the person who's really courageous and has big free will. I'll post some of his information in the description box for you so you can read up on it. I disagree. I disagree with that theory, uh, but you guys tell me what you think, okay? Let me go to the chat box. I want to introduce you to some ideas, some concepts, and I want to help you see the control that you do have over your life. I am, before we go to the chat box, let me explain that I am the kind of therapist that often says to my clients, I think that you are impacted by what has been written in your storyline. You know, I think we all have stories and it didn't just start when we had a terrible experience. I think our stories began when we were conceived. And so there we are, you know, in our life, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future, right? We have no idea how things are going to impact us, but we're living out this story every single day. And everything that we do and say and experience is most likely predestined. This is my view, predestined. But then you also have free will. And so your decision and your ability to make proper decisions goes 
you know, neck and neck with the predestination. So both are at play. Okay. So I usually say to my clients, I believe that you're living out your storyline. This is, this is where you're supposed to be, no matter how painful it is, but let's use your free will to make good sense out of what's going on and to get you out of this. So that's my take on this. I want to teach you, though, the control that you have that might be helpful and kind of boosting your confidence, especially if you feel like you're a part of a generational curse within your family. OK, <clears throat> let me go to the chat box and see what you guys are saying. Yeah, I'm going to put B's comment up here. Um, B says everything happens for a reason. For some reason. Yes. Yes, I do agree with that. Yeah. Fairy girl, are you asking are you asking me what advice I would give to a friend? Maybe you can clarify for me and I'll be happy to answer that. Um Yeah. Yeah, fairy girl, clarify that for me if you could. Um if you're asking me what advice would I give to a friend, let me know. I'm happy to read that comment and give you the answer. Kyra knows, are you feeling overwhelmed? I'm sorry. Tell me and I can break this down a little bit because maybe it is a lot to take in. It's a lot for my brain tonight. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Critter says, I've been starting to practice. Is that key gong? I probably messed that up. Um, So you're practicing something that's making you feel immediately intense? Is that what you're saying, Critter? I don't know. I'm confused on that comment. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm confused. Reword it for me. It's not you. It's me. <laughs> It's not you, it's me. I'm almost certain of that. Kyra knows uh, 144 says, thank you for this, Tamara. I really appreciate you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. I hope this is making sense, guys. Sometimes I hear it in my own mind. And because I study this, I know it. And I'm like, I feel like I'm saying blah, 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 blah to my camera. But, you know, you guys are validating and confirming it's making sense. So thank you for that. And I'm so happy it's making sense. R.A. Andrew says, listen to Tamara. Oh, I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying. This is giving me a migraine. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Thank you for that, R.A. Andrews. I appreciate that. Annie Walker says, oh, wow. I guess that's what creates learned helplessness, external locus of control. 100%. Absolutely. Bing. You got the answer, Annie, because here's what happens. And this is um, a topic that you know, introduction to psychology classes in college is all about. Um, you will see this topic in an introduction to psychology course or book that external locus of control does cause learned helplessness. Learned helplessness uh, was a term that was coined by Martin Seligman. Uh, he's a behaviorist. He's a professional uh, who studies behaviorism. And here's what he says. Um, he did a research study using rats. And he says that these rats, when they would try to escape out of the cage that they were in, he would shock them. So he administered, it sounds cruel, I know, uh, but unfortunately, this is how the U.S. does things. I'm not that. I'm not that. I'm not that okay with it. I'll put it that way. But this is this is what he would do. Okay, in his experiments and in his desire to understand human behavior, he would allow the the rats to get close to the exit door of the cage, and when they would try to escape, he would shock them. Right. And when he would shock them, the rats would jump back. There's actually a video on this. Um, maybe I'll post it in the description box for you so you can kind of see this research yourself. Um, then he would allow the rat to kind of, you know, sturdy himself and the rat would go back to the exit door. And boom, there's another shock. Right. It was like a low voltage shock, if you will. And so the rat is just kind of like, what the heck just happened a second time? OK, did it a third time, went to the door, shock. And the rat is kind of like, okay, I give up. I'm done, right? And what does the rat do? He goes over in the corner of the cage and he just kind of sits there almost fearful, okay? And so Martin Seligman concluded in this so-called research study that human beings function the same way. 
right? The, once they're shocked or they have a bad experience or they have a traumatic relationship or they lose their job and they experience PTSD or they have complex PTSD uh, because of growing up in a bad household, it almost, for some people, the more they experience trauma over and over and over again, or maybe even just a negative relationship or a negative experience, they kind of learn in order to avoid that pain, I'm just going to be over here and do absolutely nothing. So learned helplessness. It's a, it's a, if you ask me, it's a mental trap. And it says, I can't get out of this no matter what I do. And so therefore I give up. And so there are some people who believe that predestination is that exactly, that my life has already been um, pre-designed and so what's the point in trying? Because I don't know what's coming up next, right? So yeah, it gets pretty deep. Thank you for that, Annie Walker. I hope that was helpful in explaining Martin Seligman to you guys. Hi, Ronald Zion. Welcome to the chat. So glad to see you. Okay. Let me keep going. <laughs> Cherry Jubilee, that is so cute. I love it. Born to Survive says, hello. First time here. Welcome. Glad to have you. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat. Thank you so much, Kyra Knows. I appreciate that. I really appreciate you for that. Um, Live Life mentions somatic therapy. Let me just say for those of you who are struggling with PTSD, complex PTSD, some kind of chronic or acute stress disorder, I do love somatic therapy for that. Um, and so I will post some information in the description box for you. Um, since we're talking about trauma and trauma shaping our life experience, somatic therapy can actually be a very great uh, way to kind of engage the relationship between the mind and the body. So I'll post some information on that for you. Kevin Bell, hello and welcome, says, I do not believe in curses. I do believe, I do, I do know of karma, the law, the laws of, of this reality, and lessons that must be learned the hard way or vicariously via others' results. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Some people don't believe in curses, you know. Um, let me just kind of piggyback off of that, Kevin Bell, and say that most of our research. Uh, suggests to us that a small group of people believe in family curses. And that would be certain cultures and ethnicities. I have two different cultures and ethnicities that believes in family or generational curses. One is the African-American side and the other is the Native American Apache side. And so both of my um, ethnicities and races uh, tell me that a family curse is a generational curse. And it's really difficult to un to unwire that, you know, and if it's <clears throat> excuse me, and if it's generational, it's really difficult to unwire that, you know, because your mother and her mother and her mother did things very similarly. And so now it gets passed down to me or whoever's after me. Right. Uh, research also suggests that most individuals who are from ethnic groups or my minority groups or the people of color culture believe in family curses more than other people do or other races and cultures. <clears throat> I figured I would throw that in here. OK, I'm going to take that off. Cherry's Jubilee, I, I have to. Um, I have to read your comment before I put it up here. I know what GTSY means this time. Good to see you. Good to see you as well, Kyra knows. Last week, I didn't know what that meant. So we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. Chrome Butterfly says, yes, Tamara, you will find MK Ultra fascinatingly scary. Okay, okay. I'm going to look it up, I promise. I'm going to look it up. Um, Knuckles, hello and welcome to the chat. Glad to have you. I don't remember you. So welcome to the live tonight. Um, I'm just going through guys and then we are going to jump back in. Okay. Jajet says it is sometimes difficult to believe in predestination when scientifically minded people like you and me believe not only in God, but also in sociological role theory, 
right? And the constitution, right? And that is why, let me throw some more research and history at you guys, then we're gonna get back into the content. That is why a lot of fields have separated from the field of psychology. So I'm gonna be honest uh, with my field. It was never really looked at in the past as a legitimate science because psychology studies the very thing that we can't see, which is the brain, right? Now, we could put you in an MRI machine and see chemicals in your brain. We can also see the chemicals would be the neurotransmitters. We can also see sometimes your thoughts and how chemicals interact with other chemicals or brain regions can light up on an MRI machine. But psychology doesn't do that, right? We deal with theories and concepts and theories of behavior. And so, Jajets, to your point, psychology over time separated from philosophy, religion, demonology, right? It's neurology, phenomenology, existentialism, psychology separated from all those different fields because it's really hard to, to blend together concepts. So you're right. You know, it's really difficult to believe in predestination when there's other things that you believe in. For me, as I stated on this video, to be transparent, I believe in predestination, but I also believe that we have a free will to choose. Um, and we can either choose to go left or right, and that's going to determine the rest of our lives, you know? So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Okay, let's jump back into this content, guys. I don't want to bore you with my banter, and we definitely want to wrap up here soon. So, so let me give you kind of what psychology has identified as. Um, some ways that you can have some control, some control over your life. Um, and I also think too, and I use this in therapy with my clients in my practice, I think that you can use these as well to feel like you have some agency, some control, free will over what's happening to you. Because the minute you feel like your toxic relationships are going to keep happening, that's when you learn to be helpless, right? That's when you become like that rat and you say, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Some people also put up their defenses and say, nope, you're not getting in. I don't care how you look, what you say, what you do, you're not getting in. And so that, you know, foundation of fear is built off of believing you have no control, but I think you do have some control. So here's one thing. Uh, psychology says that you can have what's called cognitive control. If, if you feel like your life is out of your control and you can't decide, you can't seem to make decisions that are healthy or beneficial for you, or you end up in the same relationships over and over, psychology says you can have cognitive control. You can pause, you can process, you can think through things, you can decide to be a little bit more cognitive than emotional, and you can also learn to make better and healthier decisions over time. Even if you have a traumatic history or you have PTSD or complex PTSD, you can still have that history, but you can learn how to be a little less emotional and more cognitive. So psychology says you can have control over things in the now by becoming a little bit more cognitive. That I think that's more easier said than done, but it's a possibility. You also want to focus on kind of shifting your thoughts to an internal locus of control. You want to ask yourself, how can I, how can I influence this situation here? You know, I, I, for example, I grew up in a home. This is an example for you. I grew up in a home that was cold and callous. You know, my mom was a narcissist. My dad was a narcissist. You know, my sibling, you know, was a sociopath. I felt trapped in my family. My extended family was crazy, crazy for lack of a clinical term tonight, whatever, whatever, whatever the example would be. Okay. So you may look at that and say, that terrible upbringing, that terrible childhood trauma, that terrible situation in my past is going to dictate the rest of my life. Instead of looking at, looking at it that way, you could turn the lens within and ask yourself, how can I impact the way that my life is going through my own actions, through my own decisions, and through my own behavior? How can I influence this situation? I know that's more difficult then it is, it's, it's easier. I'll put it this way. It's easier said than done, but, but once you really grasp the concept of free will and in your ability to choose, then you can say, that's my traumatic history back there. That's those negative toxic relationships I keep getting into. 
that has happened, but what can I do at this moment in time to influence the rest of my life? What can I do? A lot of you are doing it right now. You're getting educated. You're learning. You're opening your mind. You're trying to figure out how to make your life better. So there's your control right there. And Carl Jung would agree with that. The Swiss psychiatrist I mentioned earlier, he would agree that you can take your internal pain and, and use the control that you do have and make better decisions along the way. That is going to change the course of some of the things that you do. Give me one second, guys. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I told one of my clients this week, I said, there are days when I wake up and I feel hopeless. You know, I turn on the news. I see some bad things on the news. I think, oh my God, in my local area, uh, at a school that I provide psychotherapy with, um, you know, they call me to the school when there's bomb threats, you know, um, shooting threats, active shooter events, that kind of thing. And so this week was a bomb threat. I literally turned on the news and there's the school that I provide services to. And, and so, you know, the kids are in a lockdown, you know, some of the kids were crying. Some of the kids text me said, Hey, Miss Tamara, this is a terrible situation I'm in. Is there any way you can get us out of here? You know, it was a terrible situation. So some days I wake up and I look at, I look around and I think, where's the positivity? Like, I don't see it today, you know? And that's just the the human side of who I am. You know, my therapy goes out the window sometimes. That's just who I am as a human. And so what I did the other day, and I told my clients to practice this as well this week, is I looked within and I said, okay, this may be happening externally, but how can I go within and have some kind of impact on the way that this is going? Well, I can use internal coping skills. I can make sure that I don't dwell on the negatives. I can make sure that my, de my decisions from this point on are logical and healthy. I can choose to do something different today than be hopeless. And so sometimes that can be some psychology that works for you. And that's an internal locus of control. What I do is internally because of me. And so I'm going to influence my, my steps. I'm going to influence the rest of my steps today because of what's inside. I hope that makes sense. It sounds like it makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you. Um, let me also to uh, bring up that you want to learn to identify trauma reenactments in your life. Yes, life may be predestined and, and maybe you guys believe in predestination along with me. Maybe you don't. But I think that it's important if you feel relationships continue to be repetitive and you can't get out of this traumatic, toxic relationship bind, no matter what you do, it's another relationship that's similar to the last one. I think it would be helpful to pause and ask yourself, in what ways is my behavior and this relationship similar to what has happened to me in the past or has happened to a family member in the past and then try to change it from there? It's a trauma reenactment says, I'm going to pull from that last traumatic situation into my now what happened. And it's now going to kind of possess or take over my current relationship. So you wanna be able to pause and, and work through that. Ask yourself, am I repeating behaviors that have been engaged in in the past? And if so, how is this impacting me in the now? I hope that makes sense, guys. Okay, let me take a little bit of a break. I'm gonna give you the last three or four ways that you can kind of think to control your own world if you believe in predestination. Um, before we go to the chat box, let me just mention too that for those who are like me um, and, and believe in predestination, my grandmother, who was very, very religious, my great grandmother, who was very, very religious, she used to say to me all the time, she says, Tamara, my family calls me Tammy. So she would say, uh, you know, Tam is what she would call me. And, uh, and so she says, um, I, I think that we need to use, this was her advice to me at one time, we need to use prayer to change the course of things. And so my grand, my great grandmother believed that prayer in and of itself can change things. I do, I do believe in that as well. But there's also some very interesting psychological and neurological and philosophical pieces to this puzzle as well. I can only hope that I demonstrated that well in this live chat.
Okay, I'm looking at the chat box, guys. Kyra knows, I love what you say. You say knowledge is wisdom and understanding. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Caleb, you're awesome. Caleb Reed says, I'm going to start changing now. Yes. Good. I love it. Usually when you make the decision to change your life, right, especially if you have some historical trauma, the moment you begin to shift your life, that's the moment you have now started to function with an internal locus of control. You're saying that whatever's in here is going to is going to kind of influence, I should say, the rest of my life course. Yes. Yes. I like that. Lisa Smith, hello, and welcome to the chat, says, I love, yeah, me too, me too, me too, me too. I actually have one of his books somewhere in here, and, you know, it's almost like I'm internally uh, afraid to, to open it. I, I read a page, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll read the rest later, you know, because it kind of gets you thinking. Yes, Ronald Zion, I see you. Um, born to survive says, wow, I needed to hear that Carl Jung quote that describes what I'm figuring out about my traumatic childhood and life experiences. Now, I see that some of you guys have signed back on uh, the quote that uh, I'll repeat it just briefly because I think it it is a, a excellent foundation to this whole conversation. Bo uh, born to survive is referring to the statement that says from uh, Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. <clears throat> He says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call that fate. I think that's the one. Um, and so, again, he's talking about, you know, not really dealing with what's going on on the inside. And so it dictates your steps in the future. I think that's the one you're talking about, born to, born to survive. I think that's the one. I hope it's the one. <laughs> Knuckle says, is it better to learn it to control it? Is it better to learn to control it than to not learn it and it control you? I'm trying to process. <laughs> I'm trying to process. Is it better to learn to control it than to learn it and it control you? It, my, my, my quick answer to that is it really depends on the situation. Help me out, guys. I think it really depends on the situation. I'm going to leave it at that. You don't want to. So let me throw this in here. You don't want it to control you. No, no. But but I also think it depends on the situation. It, it does. That's the best way that I can tease that apart. I think it's a philosophical t uh, question too, Knuckles. You got me on that one. I'd have to sleep on that, eat breakfast on that, go work out, and then come back and give you the answer. All right, Andrew says, this is deep. Yes, and I hope I haven't lost half of you. <laughs> Because it is. So, you know, this is a secret that I keep, I think, and I'm going to throw this out here so you know where I'm coming from, that <clears throat> when I was in college, I not only I not only uh, studied and graduated with a degree in psychology, but I also studied uh, forensic science and law. And I also studied philosophy. I took about 900,000 philosophy classes. And um, and so my my background is philosophy. So I'm pulling a lot from that background. And so that's why this is a little um, deep, so to speak. R. A. Andrews. It's 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 a little bit deeper than I usually like to go live. Lisa Smith says intergenerational trauma really sucks when you're the scapegoat. Yes, it does. It's like we see the tree and no one else does. Yes, intergenerational trauma uh, can make you the scapegoat. If somebody makes you the scapegoat within your family. If you're not aware of how that has impacted you, then it's possible that you feeling like a scapegoat, you're probably going to move into a relationship. Oh, geez. Did it freeze again, guys? I'm sorry. Um, you're probably going to move into a 
relationship that's also going to cause you to be kind of the scapegoat in that relationship as well. And if you're not aware of what's unconsciously going on within you, you may leave that relationship and go on to another relationship and become the scapegoat there. So it's kind of like this repetitive thing that can feel like a predestination. I don't know why my camera does this. I really don't. So I apologize, guys. Um, but it can feel like a predestination, right? Because it's something that continues and continues on. But really, it's just there's something going on within you that needs to be dealt with. And that's why this is a repeated pattern in your life. Uh, Live Life says, yes, it took me a long time to realize I was the common denominator in all of my unhealthy relationships. Thank you for that, Live Life. Both romantic and platonic. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I agree. Sometimes you do have to look within and say, am I the common denominator here? Let's not blame predestination. Let's look at me. Am I doing something wrong? What's going on here? Jajet says, the story of Jonah, who does not follow God's will and is thrown into the water by his parents and ends up in the well's mouth fits in with the religious predestination and free will. Yes, I agree. So for those of you who are not uh, religious and um, know the story of Jonah in the well, uh, the whole idea is this, that he was purposed to do something and he didn't do it. And so therefore at the end of, you know, his inability to carry out what God wanted him to do, he became cursed. I'll put it that way, uh, because he did not listen and follow his predestined uh, route. So that's the story of Jonah in the well. I will uh, put that in the description box for you guys so you'll have a little bit of exposure to that as well. T Mac says, I'm sorry, not T Mac. Jeez, Louise, that does not say T Mac. Uh, Tanya Turner, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Welcome to the chat. Glad to see you. Says, just realizing I thought I was a social butterfly. Really, I was seeking to be affirmed. This made me attract a lot of toxicity. Very, very good. I'm glad you mentioned this, um, Tanya Turner. After becoming more whole and healed, I'm really rather reserved. Absolutely. So there we go again. There's that common denominator. It's something going on in the, in the inside. It's an unconscious thing. I need to change that and heal it so that I can then move forward in a very healthy way. Star comment of the night. Thank you so much for that. That was very helpful. Lori Abram, hello and welcome to the chat. Glad to have you. Um, Kat Sushi, oh, that's cute, says, hi, a longtime subscriber. I finally made it to a live chat. Yes, you did. So glad to have you. Thank you uh, for joining us tonight, for joining us tonight. Glad to have you. Okay, I'm going to keep going, make sure I didn't miss anything. Chrome Butterfly says, Tamara, if one sees predestination as no control, can it also be seen as an atlas, if you will, if you will, to navigating your life? Yes. So if, if, if you see predestination as no control, you having no control over your life, it, you know, it can lead you down a bad road because you become, and I hope I'm answering your question correctly, Chrome Butterfly, you become kind of depressed and hopeless, right? It's kind of like those rats in the cage again. You keep getting shocked, but you believe, excuse me, you believe that you're supposed to be getting shocked. I believe I'm being punished. I believe that I'm supposed to have parents like this. I believe I was supposed to be, be brought up poor. I believe, you know, this relationship was supposed to be in my life. The more you experience that mindset sometimes, the less hopeful you're going to be. So it's going to be difficult to shift your mind in the way of hope. I hope that makes sense. And I hope I answered your question, Chrome Butterfly. Okay, before we go back to the chat box, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, let me just give you the rest of the content and then I'm going to answer the, the uh, comments. I'm going to answer, what is going on here? I'm going to answer the comments in the chat box and then we will wrap up. Okay, guys. So let me give you the last uh, three things that can help you feel like you have a little bit more control over your life if you believe that you don't. Um, the other thing is something known as adaptation. So research suggests that if you have a, a mind that you have been predestined to experience certain bad things in life, that you then begin to take on what's called an emotion-focused coping strategy. And here's what that means. 
emotion focused coping strategy is basically a negative way to manage your thoughts, your feelings and your behaviors. You're really targeting your emotions and how you're feeling, but you're doing it in a negative way. You're not coping in a healthy way. Self-harm can be kind of like an emotion focused uh, coping skill. You know, your emotions are so strong and intense. So you reach for something and you cut yourself. That's an emotion focused coping skill. Um, a problem focused coping skill says, I see the problem. I'm going to be very cognitive about this and rational. And then I'm going to make my move from there. So research suggests the only way that you can adapt to, to life in a healthy way is to take more of a problem focused kind of a attitude rather than an emotion focused, right? That's a little complicated too. But the idea is this, that if I believe I'm predestined to experience all of these negative things, how do I keep a steady mindset? How do I remain balanced? How do I prevent myself from giving up? And that is to become problem focused look for those problem focused coping skills, going to a therapist, watching videos on YouTube that are educational, reading books, um, working out, eating healthy, um, expanding your mind and your, your, your brain to more knowledge and more education. Those are all problem focused and very healthy coping skills. Um, so research says that adaptation is important. You have to learn, even if you believe in predestination, you have to learn that adaptation over time is the way to go. You have to learn to adapt. Um, <clears throat> they also, the, the other thing that's also important here is social and cultural influence. If you get around people who have a, a mindset that's negative, if you get around people who have a mindset that is negative, that woe is me, I am being cursed, my life is there to curse me, everybody's here to curse me, I'm always blamed, no one loves me. Once you get into that mindset, then you know your mind and your emotions begin to shift in negative ways. And so research suggests that we have to be mindful of the of the influence of social and cultural factors, who we're around, who we are around and how they're impacting us. Um, and I feel like there was a third thing that I'm missing here. Uh, yes, it is. Psychology also highlights this, and I'm gonna post this in the description box for you. It's a really cool article that talks about this, that you should not become hopeless if you feel that you keep having repeated experiences of negative relationships. My mother was narcissistic. My dad was narcissistic. Now my boyfriend and girlfriend is narcissistic. Now my husband or wife is narcissistic. My boss is narcissistic. My neighbor is narcissistic. If you continue to have those repeated thoughts and experiences, or you feel like it's something that's impacting you over and over and over, you want to be able to examine it. What's going on here? Is it really that this situation is repeated in my life, or is it something within me that is kind of contributing to this, right? Do I need to change something in here so that I can change the outcomes of my life? I hope that makes sense. Okay, let me go to the chat box and we're gonna call it a night. Let me know what you guys think of this topic. It's pretty um, heavy, I agree. I see a lot of you telling me that in the chat box, um, but it's positive comments from you guys. And I, I'm very, very glad to hear that and uh, see that as well. This was our philosophical existential topic tonight, I think. Okay, let me go to the comments, live life. Let's read this one. Live Life says, in a way, trauma gets passed down from mothers to their children. We can also call that epigenetics, depending on what we're talking about. Um, genetic Epigenetics is the study of gene expression and how genetic codes kind of um, impact us in such a way as fetuses that we are born into the world with a vulnerability to trauma. So epigenetics. So uh, Live Life says, in a way, trauma gets passed down from mothers to their children because women are born with all of the eggs they will ever have. You've essentially experienced whatever your mom did before you're born. Very much true in some ways. There is some research that backs up what you're saying, Live Life. Um, I'll try to find it and post it in the description box so you guys can have that information too. Um, I just kind of skimmed over an article about this. But we can also take Live Life's comment 
Um, and we can also consider the study of gene expression and that's epigenetics. You, you ever wonder why some moms put earphones on their bellies? And it's because they're trying to influence the developmental process of the fetus. I'm trying to influence the brain. I'm trying to influence emotional expression. I'm trying to influence educational ability. Um, so some people really do believe that. So Katsu, she says, I've tried everything to alleviate the pain of living with my family therapy, medication, exercise, improving my professional life. The only thing I haven't tried is leaving. Wow, that is so rough. Um, consider this, and this is just a side note and hopefully some helpful suggestion here, that consider that everything that you have tried is a part of the puzzle. So yes, you've tried therapy, medication, exercise, improving your professional life, but that's part of the puzzle. So maybe if you do separate or put some boundaries up or you leave your family behind, just know that most likely all those other things you did were also helpful to that. You know, I, I tell my clients that all the time. Don't feel like whatever I've done in the past was a, was a failure because I think it adds up to, to the next step that you need to take, if that makes sense. Critter says, I've scapegoated from conception. Learning to lean into what's mine and what isn't is difficult and rewarding. Yeah, I can see that. Absolutely. Okay. Yoni Body, I hope I'm saying that correctly, TV. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you on tonight's live chat says, are we predestined to karmic patterns from our ancestors? Woo. Hmm. There's some research. There is. And I can post it in the description box. I'm just trying to process this for a second. Um. <clears throat> The Native American quote, I'm going to pull from that knowledge base. The Native, okay, first of all, there is research on this. So that was a fantastic question. I'm going to post it in the description box for you. But also, the Native American culture heritage, uh, particularly the uh, Apache and the Cherokee uh, cultures, do believe that if your ancestors did something wrong, that when the other generation is born or brought into the world, yes, they will be punished in a sense from the things that have happened to, for, for the things that our ancestors did wrong. I'll put it that way. And so, you know, the only culture that I'm fully aware of that believes in this is the Native American culture. We are very integrated with knowledge of our ancestors. And so, um, this is a concept that most Native Americans would just be so happy to have received because, you know, the culture does believe that if your ancestors did something wrong, that is going to trickle down to younger generations and then they will have a life that's going to be unstable because of that. That's more of a cultural, spiritual view, but there is, I think there's a few research studies on that. You're welcome, Kyra Nose. you're welcome. I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm so glad. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, it is fairy girl. Yep. Um, Kat Sushi says, my therapist and my family doctor both agree that I need to escape, but it's tough and exhausting while being in survival mode constantly. Yeah, I just told a family the other day, if you're in constant fight or flight mode, what happens is your body gets used to all that extra cortisol and stress hormone and your fight or flight system is running when you should be asleep. It's running when you should be resting. It's running when you should be happy. And so that derails sometimes your entire life. Totally get what you mean. Okay. <laughs> Helen de Salza, Salza says, this is therapy. So glad to hear that. Wonderful. Yeah. B says, you grow through what you go through. Agree. And you will keep going through it until you learn from it. Agree. Agree. I like that. I very much agree with that. 
I do. That has happened in my personal life. I failed a situation and somehow it meets me around the corner later. You know, I failed that because I didn't catch, I didn't catch the, the, the signals and now it's met me again, you know? And so sometimes when you feel like things keep meeting you over and over and over at different points in time in your life, that might be a sign. You have to beat this. You have to overcome this and then it'll, it'll leave you alone. I've heard of that. I believe that could possibly be uh, something that works in people's lives. Okay, let me keep going because we're going to wrap up, guys. Yes, you're welcome, Annie Welker says, thank you for your wonderful explanations. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. Blue Galaxy says, Tamara, welcome to the chat, by the way. Tamara, I believe it was the will of God that you are helping so many people. Oh, that's so, that's so sweet. Thank you. I have been through a lot of trauma in my life, but in my opinion, the Lord keeps on leading me and teaching me lessons. Yes, totally agree. Totally agree. That's at the foundation of all my work, by the way. I never say it. I never verbalize it, but that's at the foundation of my, my own growth. So thank you for that, Blue Galaxy. And that's wonderful to hear. Um, R.E. Andrews says, narcissistic parents continue, uh, I'm sorry, condition, excuse me, narcissistic parents condition their children to learned helplessness. Yes, that can happen as well. How many times uh, can a child who is impressionable and vulnerable have a narcissistic parent tell them that they are unworthy in many different ways before they start to believe it? So yes, you're right. Narcissistic parents do condition their children. Yes, yes, yes. Black girls getting their shift together. Hello and welcome. Glad to see you in tonight's live chat. Um, that, that chick. Hello and welcome. Glad to see you. Welcome. <clears throat> That's so sweet. Thank you for that cat sushi. I'm, I'm very, very, um, glad to hear that. Sun goddess moon child. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you tonight. Says very much generational and specific to cultures. Yep, it is. It is. Born to survive says I have Apache ancestor too. Yeah. I love that culture. I just do. I couldn't understand for many years of my development. Why do I love the music and the culture? And then, and then I was able to pull up my ancestors history and information. And then when my grandmother passed away and my great grandmother passed away, um, I was able to pull records and I'm like this, why wasn't I ever told, you know? So, and my dad's side of the family. It is what it is. It's family trauma for me. I think poppy four, four. Hello. And welcome. Glad to have you says I was cursed with those toxic relationships, but I am breaking those curses to attract better people. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's wonderful. Once you catch the signal that, okay, this is toxic and it continues, I need to stop this. It's just going to keep happening, right? Happening if you don't stop it. It's like a cycle. <clears throat> Um, thank you for the super chat, Blue Galaxy. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for that. Courtney Frazier, hello and welcome. Welcome. You can go back into the replay. We're going to sign off here in just about a little bit. Um, Cherry's Jubilee, did I get to your comment? I don't know. I'm looking. I'm looking. Oh, hit the wrong buttons. What? I do that every chat. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Cherry's Jubilee. I'm looking before I sign off here. <clears throat> Critter says, once you see the generational trauma, you can't unsee it. That is very, very true. Very true. If we can stop it, we change the future. True. We don't continue passing it on. And that change, that change everything be the change. It does change everything. Once you see the trauma, then you can change the trauma. But if you're blind, you can't change it. So therefore it continues. Very much agree with that. Minimal, minimally Leah. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Glad to see you in tonight's live chat says, yay, I caught you live. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad you could come on. We're going to sign off here in just a little bit. I'm looking for you, Cherry's Jubilee. 
<laughs> Chrome Butterfly says, Tamara, this is wonderful. Please do a part two. Oh, I was hoping you guys would be bored tonight and be like, please don't ever talk about this ever again. We could literally do this for months. You know, um, I will go ahead and ponder though, for sure, Chrome Butterfly, another topic like this. Um, whew. Going over the research though, I'm like, mm, no wonder I didn't, I didn't major in philosophy. Whew. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Betsy. Hello. Welcome to the track. Glad to, glad to see you tonight. I'm just saying hello to you before we go. Felicia Adams. Hello. And welcome says hello, Tamara. How are you? And everyone on, the, everyone on the chat. I thought that was my tea. Um, we are doing okay. I hope you're doing well too. Born to survive says I acknowledge I was a victim but I won't make victimhood my identity. Yeah, that's very nice. Absolutely. Yeah, th that's a nice way to develop your internal locus of control that I'm going to change what's in here so I can change what's outside of me. I like that. <clears throat> I'm going to post your commentaries, Jubilee. That's interesting. Yeah. Cherry's Jubilee said, I said I realized that I was shamed for being smart and praised to others. It was so confusing that I always doubt my ideas. Yeah, I'm sure you do. And that's another thing that conditions you and it can influence your life in such a way that you feel like it's predestination when it's really not, you know? Okay. Thank you, Kyronos. Thank you. You guys are awesome too. And you are too, Kyronos. Thank you so much for that. Um, prayer brings us closer to God and grows our relationship with him. Yes, I do very strongly believe in that. Chrome Butterfly says, Tamara, my great grandmother was the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love great grandmothers. They're awesome. Yeah. Me too, Annie Welker. Me too. Okay, guys, I could talk to you for a whole other hour, but we've been on here really, really long tonight. So I am going to sign off here. B says, Tamara, have you ever been a guest speaker in college classes? Yes. And I never, I never want to do it again. I never want to do it again. Here's why. B, B, and I, I did like an introduction to psychology class with a professor. Here's what happened. Those kids had so many questions for me that by the end of that class, I felt like I was spun around like, like a pinata, you know, um, I love like young energy though, you know, but, uh, sometimes it's tiring. I have to go to bed at 5 PM so I can be ready for them. B says, uh, if, and if so, would you be a guest speaker for my final in my victimology class? <laughs> That's so sweet. Email me the details. I'll definitely consider it B. That's so sweet. Thank you for that. That's so sweet. But I did feel like a pinata in the classes I used to teach. Okay. SW, hello and welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight. Says, how do we make the unconscious conscious? Woo, yeah. So let me give you a couple things. One, one thing I suggest to my clients is you need to learn to be mindful. Mindfulness is not just sitting and humming to yourself and meditating. Mindfulness is this, that I am sitting in the moment. I'm quiet. I'm being aware of what's around me. I'm actually hearing things. I'm actually seeing the things in the room. I'm actually focusing on my chewing, what I'm eating at the moment. I'm focusing on my internal thoughts, you know, mindfulness. So I often encourage my clients to practice mindfulness, go out and buy a mindfulness book, learn about it, go online. Mindfulness centers your mind to the now. And so that's what you need to make the, the unconscious conscious to yourself, right? Because I think the world is so fast paced and we're so busy and caught up that we never have the minute to sit down or the moment to sit down and really process even what we're thinking, right? <clears throat> we're not we're not able to access metacognition. Um, so because of that, mindfulness can be helpful. The other thing is journaling. I find that if you journal and write down your thoughts, even you know, even if you're writing it down as you're talking to yourself, um, that is good too. Therapy can be helpful for some people. Prayer and meditation can be helpful. There's many different ways to make the unconscious conscious. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yes. 
Yes. Okay. All right, guys. I am going to sign off. You guys are so awesome. And I love what you guys are saying. Uh, born to survive, you are right. Knowledge is power. I hope these conversations are helpful to all of you. Um, I hope tonight wasn't a bunch of blah, 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 but that you really heard the foundation of this conversation, which is, yes, predestination may exist, but yes, you also have pre free will. And here's a variety of ways that you can look at this so that you're not blaming yourself and so that you're not stuck in the past. So that's basically what this chat was all about. I may do a live chat tomorrow. We'll see 6 p.m. Eastern time. You'll see it in my community section. If I decide to, we'll do a different topic. We might talk about stalkers tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, there's a variety of things we could talk about. But in the meantime, I hope you guys have a wonderful night. Thank you for being with me tonight. I'll see you in the next live chat. Bye-bye. Have a safe weekend, by the way.